I'm on. Ready when you are, CB. We're already uh, logged into Facebook? You're all in. You go. Good evening. Hi, my name is Bill Abramoff, and I'm here with Tony Davenport. He's behind the camera. Just stick around, Tony, for a little bit. Uh, I'm doing this for the Long Island Blues Society, doing a little uh, demo presentation, blues guitar. Uh, my boy, my computer. Okay. And some of the stuff that I've played over the years, some of the people that have uh, caught my interest, styles that I've listened to, that I've played, and the like. So, I think I'll just start by playing a little blues. So, that was a blues in E, I'm just kind of messing around with it, and I was playing in a shuffle style, I guess I should explain this in terms of the way they, they normally construct, there's so many different kinds of blues, but a 12 bar blues, when they say 12 bars, they mean 12 measures, uh, you can count time in any way you want, understand that there's a pulse in music, so if I counted out this pulse, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four. So each set of four would be a measure. This is the third measure, fourth measure, chord switches, and back to this first chord. Fifth chord. So that was a 12 bar blues. What I did was I played the E chord. We have a visitor. I played the E chord, hi Susie, for four beats, for four measures, and then I played the A chord for two measures, E chord for two measures, played the B chord for a measure, the A for a measure, the last two bars were an E finishing up with a B. That being said, that's only one way to structure a 12 bar blues. The other thing you probably notice is I said it was four beats, but if, if you were able to count, you would have heard me going. That, that was really eight times I hit the guitar in that fourth beat. So technically I subdivided the beats into two for every one beat. We could go crazy talking about this. There's not really much of a point in, in this short presentation. The only thing I will say is that the only difference between this beat, which we commonly know is what we call a shuffle in the blues, and this beat, that beat is more of a rock beat. That doesn't mean you can't play blues with a rock beat. The difference is the way the two eighth notes, that's what they call them, lope in the shuffle. 
long followed by a short, and a rock beat would be. Next thing I guess I should talk about in this beginnings is if you play guitar, you know this is an E chord, and if you haven't played a shuffle in what I call the Jimmy Reed style, and I didn't invent that name, they call it the Jimmy Reed style because Jimmy Reed popularized it. It wasn't like he was the first person, but it's really just a little bit of the E chord. I'm actually missing one of the three notes that make up a chord, so sometimes they call this a power chord, and what in, in this kind of a riff, which is really a very simple riff, He's just alternating, whoever does this, between those two notes while we play the chord. We get to alternate. We just put the triplet in. was they call it a turnaround it's just a transition between the two beats of E and the two beats getting to the B the B is a chord that kind of tells you to go back to E your ear says that you hear it that way they call that a dominant chord so a lot of times in the blues they play this it's called a chromatic run which is just simply there's no intervals that could have been played between those notes unless we're talking about blues. Sometimes you're in between the note and the blues. That being said, this, the notes divide on the guitar, the smallest divisions are chromatic. I could have done it that way, I could have done it this way. I could have done it this way. This gets to the point of what I'm about to tell you, which was that I didn't listen to blues first. When I wanted to play guitar, the first thing I listened to that really caught my ear to play guitar was the rock music that was popular at that time that I was listening. So it was actually guys like Eric Clapton playing with Cream, Jeff Beck with his own band, Jimmy Page, Led Zeppelin, Mike Bloomfield. These were all basically blues guitar players playing blues and or rock. So that little figure that I just played. There's a chromatic run or turnaround that Clapton kind of lifted off of a uh, Skip James tune, who was an old blues guy. Uh, and uh, they wound up putting it on the song for the beginning and end of the song. So a lot of the stuff that we play and by the way, Tony, can I put the guitar down here where it's comfortable, or are we still going to see it? Okay. That's what you can see. Close enough, right? Yeah, we can. There you go. Okay. That's the opening lit, I'm so glad, which was a Skip James song. Okay, so... When I first started picking up the guitar, I had a friend, he, I guess we were about 16 at the time, and he was really so good already, he could play all this stuff. And so I went over to his house and he started, started showing me licks. So he showed me like, you bend strings this way, he said. And so see, you have to notice I kind of moved the string when I bent it. So if I just bent this note, bending means to, to push the string and held it, it, it kind of has a flat sound, but 
It adds sustain, it adds color. So that's what they call that vibrato, what I'm really doing when I move the string. That's the pitch of the note, and to move it, I'm actually changing the tension on the string as I move it, and it actually raises the pitch of the note. So technically, when I play this, this D here, and then I put vibrato on it, I'm actually a little bit sharp, meaning the note's a little higher, because I can't possibly make the string looser when I do this. But to the ear, it sounds okay. On the other hand, if I bend a note up, I'm actually really never above it. Um, the, the mean average is slightly below the pitch. And Aria likes it that way. I mean, I learned to do it that way because he showed it that way, and it comes from a long time of practicing. So we get used to when we bend notes. To me, that sounds right. Everybody's got their own sound and vibrato. But if I went too far, it wouldn't sound right. So it sounds, there's the key. Anyway, so that was the kind of stuff he was showing me. But after I bought the albums, Cream albums and the Hendrix albums and the like, and I'm learning these licks and the stuff, I started to see, oh, Crossroads. It says on the album, Crossroads, Robert Johnson. So Cream didn't write the song, so I bought, the, I bought a Robert Johnson album, and I'll show you a little bit of what he plays. I think they call it Kind Heart of Blues. And you can see all these, this is, a, this is like from, I think, 1927, a basically, a, probably very likely a poor and uneducated guy, no schooling, is playing all these sophisticated chords. Some of the chording and figures that Robert Johnson played in the song, Kind Hearted Woman. This is a 12 bar blues, just like I played before. It's in the key of A. So the three chords used in this case were A, D, and E. So that A chord was a chord he never played. This is basically your first A chord. He never played that chord in the song. He started with an A7, and he didn't even do this or this. He did this. It's a more sophisticated, to me, it's a, it's, he had to have people around him that had figured out cool sounds and then to go for the second chord in between, which is either suggesting the note below it, A flat, or even possibly suggesting a diminished chord, which again is a more complicated chord, is pretty sophisticated. Does the same chord up here. Here's his A7. Here's, a, here's an open A for the chord. Here's an A in the chord. He moves the A chord down, but keeps the A. So now you've got you've got contrasting interests of one note staying the same and two, and the chord changing. It's sophisticated. This D seventh is now has an F sharp in the bass. It's not a D. It's not a D seventh. It's a D seventh with an F. -sharp. Sharp in the bass. The e lick. Notice the turnaround here. Once again, this is a chromatic idea. 
is his A chord like this, which he didn't play completely. He's got his A on top. He's got an A on the bottom. Now he's got the moving line. While the A is still ringing. Or he could have gone and he probably did sometime. you might have used in some songs. That's, in, that's one of the figures later on in the song. see from the little bit I played here it's pretty sophisticated for an older blues and I used to listen to these things and I said this is very cool stuff and obviously guys like Clapton were listening to this they were getting those figures down even though they were playing maybe faster songs or they because they had the bass player and the drummer so they didn't have to worry about playing two parts so you know you can see me hitting I don't know if you can see on the, on the screen but I'll use my thumb to hit my bass note and I'll use other fingers to get chords or melody sounds. That's a, that's a little magic Sam rip. So that's done a lot in blues is to be working a bass string while you're playing the melody with other fingers. This way the guitar is a little bit more double voiced like a, you would see a piano player play two hands so they get two different sounds going on, you can do that with the guitar. Uh, I think that'll bring me to another style that I picked up early on. I forget who showed it to me, but somebody showed me that if you take your thumb, or it could have been the pick, and back and forth between two strings on the chord, you're playing four beats of the measure. But I still have other fingers free. Mississippi John Hurt piece uh, called Spike Driver Blues or John Henry and it's this is a uh, pretty simple what he did but yet it's not so there's your open G chord he's got this bass thing going now he's got melody notes the G the F the D the E the B flat Another E there, and a G. So he's got a whole little scale. That's his scale. He didn't actually bend that note, so it's kind of a blues scale. The note, the first note being the first note of the scale, the second note, the third note technically he's playing a minor third and the fourth, the fifth, sixth, the seventh is flatted. And in traditional blues, we don't play it like this most of the time. See if I play that scale. That seventh note, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. If I added that seventh note to a G chord, would not sound like the blues that we're talking about today. The one that we want to hear is this note, lower. So that's what they call the seventh or the flattest seventh, and that's typical in all these songs. 
So the other thing that's sophisticated about the way this song is created is some of these notes that he picks are in between the beat and some of them are on the beat. And this creates a bounce, a flow, a syncopation, as they call it, to the music. And I'll play it slow so you can hear. So you can, you can hear the notes coming in between and on. And at a faster speed, it just sounds much more... They also call that Travis Pickman. It goes back to a guy, I think in the 50s, called Merle Travis. So technically, he didn't really invent that style. That style was done, it was really probably emulating uh, the piano styles of what was popular for uh, ragtime music. Because the bass on the piano would play in that 4-4 fashion with an alternating bass line. And that's, that's got transferred to guitar Later on, they called it Travis Picking, but you call it whatever you want. Uh, he didn't invent it, he just got really good at it. Uh, I'll show you another one with Travis Picking. Uh, I learned this song from a Mike Bloomfield album that I bought in the early 70s. Mike Bloomfield, a guitar player, through the early 60s to the early, I think, to the early 80s when he died, uh, was one of the leaders in blues and rock guitar throughout the years that he was popular. Uh, in fact, these guitars, Les Pauls, <laughs> the period of Les Pauls they made between 1958 and 1960, of which they made about 1,400, those that exist are worth like $200,000 today, even though you could buy a guitar like this basically for anywhere from 500 to 2,000 to 4,000 to 5,000 being made nowadays. So why is that guitar worth $200,000? Well, one of the reasons is Mike Bloomfield because he was the first big name in rock and roll or blues to play the Les Paul as the configuration existed when they made it to look like this in 50, 58, really, which was this pickup and a sunburst finish, previous one being a gold top. Everybody wanted to be Mike Bloomfield. So, <laughs> this tune. called Kansas City was I forget I forget the original version it was in the early 20s who did it didn't even sound anything like that but that was Mike Bloomfield's version just a rough approximation of it he's got other riffs he does in it once again notice I can't even do a slow So once again, you can hear that syncopation. Some people would play these notes all with just the one finger. And I use two fingers on it. Once again, there's that Travis Pick style, very popular in blues. You wonder if it's been used in other songs. 
It's always been used in other songs. In this, is what they call roots music. If you go back to, okay, if you go back to Elvis. That's a Scotty Moore lick. Travis picked. He probably used a thumb pick on it. You have more of a thump, like this. Etc. Etc. So it's used a lot. It wasn't just in the old country blues. It was used in rock and roll. You could hear Brian Setzer and a lot of his rockabilly stuff using that kind of a Travis pick thing. All right. So I, I, I've used this kind of picking all the time, even when I'm playing rock and roll. I mean, if, if I was doing, let's say, Key to the Highway and I wanted to play it like this. But I could also go. Travis pick is used in blues as well. It isn't always just the shuffle beat. It, it could be Travis picking thing. Okay, so we've covered some of the early blues guys. Oh, I should, before I switch too much to like more modern blues, I think I should talk about Billy Gibbons playing a song like LaGrange. <laughs> something that has been played so many times before, go back to like John Lee Hooker stuff. style that John Lee Hooker played is part and parcel of stops is harder to the high key. etc. You could see that he, he used John Lee Hooker's kind of a boogie rhythm and he used Robert Johnson's style of a turnaround. He's playing blues. ZZ Top, big old band from Texas, little old band from Texas playing boogie rock, was playing blues. And this is what's been going on in rock for the longest time. They they took from their influences and the, and the the roots of rock are in blues. There's a lot of country in, in rock, there's a lot of blues, there's a, rock, a lot of rockabilly in rock. All these music kind of meld together. It's almost 
it's almost doing a disservice to say a band or a musician is a blues musician or what you're listening to, it's blues or it's not. You know what? At some point, where is it not blues? Yeah. So pick it sounds better. So that's the lick to Susie Q, which is really a roots rock song. Dale Hawkins, it was his hit. I guess he wrote it. The guitar player on it was James Burton. James Burton's a country guitar player, a rock player, and yet that's really a blues lick. In fact, it isn't all that much different from That lick was from Smokestack Lightning. That's Howlin' Wolf. Howlin' Wolf is as blues as you're going to get. 50s Chicago blues. That's the lick. Uh, Hubert Sumlin played it. James Burton basically took that lick and put it, James Burton being pretty much a rock, rockabilly country guitar player, took that lick, put it on a rock and roll song. So you can see how there's a lot of blending of styles in music. If you limit it too much by saying it's got to be blues, it's got to be rock, it's got to be country, it's got to be this, that, the other thing, it's too limiting. So, in fact, when uh, when John Fogarty covered the song, let me see if I can remember how he played it. I can't even remember, but John Fogarty did not play the lick with a vase. So, when... When James Burton did it, oh, Suze Q, oh, Suze Q, oh, Suze Q, baby, I love you, Suze. So what he did there, they call that a dead thumb bass, is if you played it with a thumb, doesn't matter whether you play with a thumb or pick. The key is, instead of alternating, bass is going in that dead thumb fashion, the lick is there, syncopated, picked. Rock, blues, country, rockabilly, not really sure. I know I like them all. And uh, that's the first thing I'm going to suggest to anybody who's out here listening wants to play guitar or does play guitar and wants to learn more about guitar and likes various kinds of music. Try not to just limit yourself to say, I'm a blues guitar player. In fact, I remember a long time ago, I met this guy named Paul Osher, who was... Uh, a Monica player for uh, Muddy Waters. I met him in Brooklyn. He wasn't playing with him at that time. And he's and he says, uh, I met him in a music store. He says, so what do, you, what do you want to try to do? I said, well, I don't know. I just want to play guitar. He says, you don't want to just play blues? And I said, I'm not sure. I think I just want to play as much as I can. And 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 just, just to credit Paul Osher, one of the best blues players, he just passed away recently. Uh, in the true Chicago style that you'll have ever play, seen, play, played the guitar, played the harmonica, and the guitar at the same time, like a lot of those guys did. Because after all, if they were out there trying to make some money, whether they busking at uh, street corners or playing little parties or whatever it would be, one person's a lot cheaper than three. So uh, um, most of those guys back then, they learned how to play a couple of instruments, sing at the same time. Some of them, you know, um, one guy, would hook up all sorts of stuff with his feet, hi-hats and the like, to be a one-man band. Very, very, very much was done back then. Uh, still is today. You got guys like Tommy Emanuel. He can play lead, rhythm, bass, and drums all at one time on his guitar. But, you know, he's not a mere mortal. I'm sure if you've heard of Tommy Emanuel or seen any of his playing, 
you know what I'm talking about. All right, maybe I'll switch gears a little bit because I'm not really, well, I'm not an expert on any kind of blues, but I probably play more of the, uh, I guess you'd call it full band style of blues uh, than, than single note, than acoustic guitar blues. So I'm gonna show some of the electric playing influences and styles that I picked up over the years. So I think the first guy I want to talk about is Eric Clapton, because he was one of the first guys that I was really hoping to be able to understand how to play his music. And I think I'll use this song Strange View as, a, as an example. So this is, a, I got this loop pedal that I hooked up. It's got the rhythm for it. And I'm going to play his lead and then I'll go over what he did. This is the key of A. So, first thing I want to say about that little, those two verses of phrase that I played, roughly the way they were on the record, the first one being the introductory uh, solo and the second one being the solo that he played in between the verses, is they're really Albert King licks. Clapton loved all blues players, so on this song and some others, he was really enamored with Albert King. And... The progression probably was like some of Albert's progressions in sort of a rock blues feel. I think originally the song was Lordy Mama, and they wound up taking the rhythm track and redoing the vocals, uh, but he really played it like an Albert thing. So what I mean by that is his choice of notes, and I guess I should start, maybe I should back up just a little bit. So if you've been playing a little blues guitar and you're trying to improvise, Somebody has probably told you at some point in time that you play the pentatonic scale. And people will tell you that all those notes will be good on a blues progression in that key. And if I, if I put this looper back on and play those notes, you can see what I mean. notes probably to anybody's ear would say there's nothing wrong with those notes. Of course the way I played them that way it didn't really sound very interesting because you just can't play mechanically. You have to play in a way that even though there's just a few notes there are melodies to be found. A lot of times it's just a group of two or three notes around the chord chord itself would have been, and he played, so one of them, this one, would have been a scale note, not a chord note, and he didn't play this note, he played this note, and this is, this is one of the, I guess, the anomalies of the blues, so you're in a major key, meaning that the third note of the scale is what they call a major third, a minor, and we all know that sound. That's the minor third. So the chord that they played, which was an A7, has this note, this C sharp, which is a third, but yet in many cases, people will tell you, and certainly Clapton did, but he didn't really, he went 
It was somewhere in between and here. The note doesn't exist to be written down. Between C and C sharp is about what he played. And those kind of inflections, whoop. those kind of inflections are part of what makes the charm of the way he played it. So the first thing he did on the lead, this was an Alma thing, to bend that note to here, five notes higher than the actual note, is the note that I think he was going for. That's an Albert thing. Albert King would play like this all the time. That's Albert, all of his notes in one spot. is a kind of an Albert way that he phrased all his songs. So that's the first thing Clapton did on this solo. Then, so you can hear there's a lot of inflections as I try to emulate the sound between the, the way the notes are bent. Has three notes with one pick. I'm up, I'm down, pull off, that's creating this note to go to this, all with one pick. And even a little pull off or push, maybe a vibrato. Put the song on, it doesn't even matter. You don't have to play exactly what, in fact, you really can't. It'll make you crazy trying to always play what other people play. So. So I kind of played that more free form, uh, you'd call it improvisation. I'm just playing notes that I know sound good. In my head, I'm still kind of thinking the feel and the phrasing of the way Clapton played the song. I probably put less space in it, which will happen at times. Clapton put a lot of space in between those licks because it creates more tension. It sounds good if you leave a little space here and there. Uh, but all the inflections that I'm using are really the kind of techniques, I guess you'd call them, that make this sound what it is. Bending notes, vibratoing notes, sliding into notes, hitting the strings harder, softer, how you work a note up and down into the... notes that I'm playing are really in this fashion. That's, that's too static sounding. That's the only way I can put it. So part of playing blues is 
you really have to listen to songs an awful lot. And then you, you can come up with your own style a little bit here and there, but it's good to listen to these guys. I listen to all these guys. Uh, I can only tell you that it helped me a lot to learn their licks. And then even if I couldn't play them like they played them, it becomes part of my own playing or would for you as well if you're still trying to do this kind of stuff. And there is no stopping on it anyway. We always, no matter how long we're playing, we continue to try to learn new things. So that was one of my heroes, Eric Clapton. Uh, I think I'll show you another one. All right, so let's, let's kill that loop. That's the end of that one. All right, so I'll just put a little backing track here so I can play leads like another guy. Tony says I wasn't loud enough. <laughs> that was a Jeff Beck lift. Uh, the song was called Rock My Plimsoll. Which is really just a takeoff on a B.B. King song called Rock Me Baby. And this is Jeff Beck from, I think, 68, 69, The Truth Group. Uh, just about the time, <laughs> strangely enough, that Zeppelin was going out there and read, just about ready to conquer the world. Jeff Beck was ready to conquer the world with a blues rock band of his own called the Jeff Beck Group. It had uh, Ronnie Wood on uh, bass guitar and it had, Ron, it had uh, Rod Stewart on vocals. I forget the drummer. Uh, and I think Dickie Hopkins played some piano. It was really blues rock. And most of the songs are blues rock on it. And they were killer. And I think he got derailed because of an injury or something. And... Uh, it's not the reason the Zeppelin made it big at that time, and he didn't, but it's kind of ironic in a way. They both had kind of the same idea at the same time, with a lead singer and a crazy good guitar player, and uh, Zeppelin hit way bigger. Of course, Jeff Beck's fame would continue to grow later on, thanks to just the, the incredible uh, breadth and depth of the styles of music that he can play so wonderfully and individualistically. Uh, the kind of things that he does on the guitar that makes him sound is just like nobody else plays like Jeff Beck. I mean, you can say that about so many guitar players, but really true in this case. So take a look at that lift. And this was a better volume. No, no, I, I, I thought you couldn't, your leads couldn't be heard over a looper. I wanted you to get the... You want me to do it again? No, no, you can. <laughs> All right. We'll anyway, I'll minutes. show you what he did there. Ten minutes. Uh, so he started with... The, there's there's the pentatonic note that he wanted to play, but once again it's about style. So he did. That's what they call the unison bend. So this this note and this note, which are not the same, 
but hold this one steady and bend this one. And then maybe a little vibrato at the end. That's the sound. So he chose two different notes. And he does this, they call it a pre-bend, I guess. It really sounds kind of almost seasick. And so he takes these two notes that are here, but he, he brings them up and then hits them. And of course, the one note is probably moving further than the other note. When it, it's just the ergonomics of your hand. And when you, I should have probably talked about that before. When you go to bend strings and vibrato, people will think that it's in your, it's about your finger movement, but it really isn't. I don't know if you can see it. If I do it this way, you can probably. You see, you see my wrist is really moving and the fingers are stationary. So anyway, because I use the thumb as an anchor. Most people that bend strings will do this. So the thumb is an anchor, and this almost becomes like a vice with your fingers. When when he when he played this lick, or when anybody plays this lick exactly like this, the third string gets moved more than the second string. So the amount of pitch variation is different on the one string than the other, and then they come down in the same. The whole thing is a very wobbly kind of a sound, which is pretty effective. And then after that, he did. Uh, and by the way, he played it in B. Once again, Jeff Beck, not a mere mortal. So I finished the lick up here. You're out of frets up there in the key of B, but that's what he did. So I kept it in A because it's, well, it's easier to see here. Also, it's easier to play than all the way up there. So then after that, he did, remember I was talking about different amounts of notes within the bend and off the bend in this position. Then, this is an example of note skipping that's very common in blues. The notes would look like this. They're played. So we skip this note. The notes really are. So, this, this note is bent, this one is bent to this one. Skips this note, plays it on the way down. Once you start to whip it around a few times quick, it starts to, it starts to have that sound. Okay, that's kind of what he did there. And then, uh, now, I talked about the minor pentatonic position. He moves up to what they call a major pentatonic position. I'll try to explain it after I play it. Okay, so... The simple way that people try to explain how to do this is they say, if your minor pentatonic position is here, you can play against the major chord three frets lower. They call that a major pentatonic because all the notes in that particular phrase, first of all, pentatonic is there's five notes from beginning to the cycle of the next octave. Second, all those notes would have been hitting the major third as opposed to minor third. So you have to realize that there's four to five places on the guitar for the same note. And that kind of gets a little confusing. So in learning any scale, any lick of any kind, it's best to kind of eventually be able to play it anywhere on the neck. So if I was to play an A minor pentatonic lick, and start down here and try to finish up here, I have a couple of comfortable choices for me. So notice I played a few of them without having to move my hand position. 
So this is one location. Next location. I could continue or I could move up to another location. So I can navigate this. Sorry, I couldn't help myself. It was a tendency. So that being said, once you learn a scale, in that case, that was the minor pentatonic scale, if you took that scale and moved it down three frets, it becomes... And that's still an A. So here's his, here's his blues lick. And I said three frets lower would be pentatonic which would be, meanwhile, I played it over here. So you say, well, I'm above where I was, but I'm actually below where it would have been in minor. Here's the major. Here's a blues position on minor. Here's a major. Here's, here's a minor. When I play them like that, it, I, if you've never seen it before, it's pretty confusing. I get it. Uh, so the only thing is you can only learn a few licks at a time. If you do it that way, eventually it will make sense. These things just become images, uh, muscle memory things over time, how they fit. So I can always tell you in a simple sense, look at this A chord right here. And a major pentatonic lick exists within this, especially if you consider A6. If I play the second note, if I look at the A here, I could do the same thing. There's my A chord, which is a C shape. So if I was to digress a little bit more at this moment, I would say that a lot of the licks that guitar players play are really built around chords, and it's what makes sense because notes and chords should somehow balance out. They should be part and parcel together. So Jeff Beck starts in a, in a kind of a minor pentatonic sound. by the way, when the D chord came in. Played the third there. He's finishing up now. We're in, we're up to the fifth, we're up to the five chord or the third chord in the progression, and this is what he's playing there. That's for the A chord, and guess what? That note that he's bending is part of an A chord. And I kind of think that he sort of, are you waving at me? One minute. One minute. Hold on, everybody. One minute. One minute. Go. Oh, <laughs> we're almost, we're done with the presentation is what Tony told me. It's 8.30. I've been, I've been talking about almost nothing for an hour. <laughs> Forgive me. So I, I will finish, uh, I will play for one minute on the way out, and by the way, uh, I thank you very much for tuning in for the Long Island Blues Society on this. My name is Bill Abramoff. Uh, by all means, please uh, look up every blues player you know at every open jam, at every gig, every rock player, learn as much as you can. I'll put this on one more time. <coughs>
Thank you so much. Good night.